What is up you guys? Welcome back to Tidal Gardens. This video is all about closed loop flow systems. We use them extensively in the tanks in the coral farm. And for some of you out there, it may be a design that makes sense for a future build. In this video, I want to go over what closed loops are and the pros and cons of using them. First of all, what is a closed loop? In short, a closed loop is a water flow system that places the pump outside of the main display, and it commonly involves plumbing the intakes and outputs directly into the walls or the bottom of the tank. You may be wondering how this is different than your typical return pump that's in a sump. And in a way, you can think of that as a closed loop because in essence it is A, a pump that is not in the display tank, B, that sends flow into the aquarium, and C, the overflow brings that water back into the intake of the pump after it goes through the entire sump area. So yes, theoretically, a sump with a return pump is a closed loop. Now, the issue arises when you want to provide even more flow than what you're sending through that sump. There are a lot of reasons to not want insane flow going through your sump, and many sumps, in fact, have very slow flow going through them. But let's go ahead and assume that we want more flow in the display tank. Your options now are to put pumps into your tank, such as power heads and whatnot, or you go with closed loops. The closed loops that we have in our systems are pretty simple. You have your pump again, but instead of drawing water from a sump, the pump's intake is plumbed directly to a hole in the tank through a bulkhead. The pump's output is plumbed to another section of the aquarium through another bulkhead. If your closed loop pump is strong enough, it can feed water to multiple outputs. There is also a lot of flexibility on how the water is sent back into the tank. We have set it up where it goes through another bulkhead on the bottom of the tank, but you can plumb it to go up and over the edge of the tank if you want to minimize the number of holes in your aquarium. This is just a very general overview of closed loops. Let's do the deep dive into the pros and cons where we can kind of suss out these details. The first advantage that a closed loop system provides is that it makes servicing the pump a great deal easier. It's sitting right there, dry to handle, and you're only really cleaning the internals of the pump. We have plenty of submersible pumps that we service regularly here, and given the choice, I would much rather deal with a dry external pump when it comes time to do a cleaning. There isn't anything funky growing on the outside of it. There's no sneaky hiding bristle worms when you go grab that pump. You basically just have a dry pump and you're servicing the impeller. The second advantage is that the pump is sending less heat into the water compared to a pump that's sitting in your tank. This may or may not be a problem in your application depending on how hot it is in your house. But in places that already require a chiller for their aquariums, an external pump is a cooler implementation than one that sits in the water. The third advantage is that the pump isn't taking up space in the tank. This is probably the biggest advantage, and I don't really know why that I saved it for third on the list, but pumps and power heads can be very unsightly and difficult to hide. I guess in theory, you could bury a pump in your rocks, but that's going to eventually turn into a maintenance nightmare when you have to take apart an aquascape to access a pump for servicing. Piggybacking on that, a closed loop allows you to get very creative on the outputs, and those can be buried deep inside an aquascape. In time, you may want to service those, but it's nothing like a pump. There's no moving parts. You can leave that plumbing untouched in your tank for years, and it will still work just fine. Fourth advantage, there is less risk of voltage leaks. The seals on pumps, while remarkably reliable, are not completely impenetrable and can fail, especially where power cables enter the housing. This risk is exacerbated by bad practice. Tell the truth now. How many times have you lifted a pump out of the water by the electrical cord? You know, the one that says, do not lift the pump with it? Eventually, seals can fail, and it sends voltage, or worse yet, heavy metals into your tank. 
That is much less likely to happen with a closed loop pump because that motor is simply not sitting in the water. Lastly, a closed loop gives you the opportunity to put a monster sized pump on your tank as a flow pump. We have used several different models here at Tidal Gardens. Off the top of my head, we've used primarily the Ecotec Vectra L2s, but also have experimented with much more expensive models from Germany, such as these Deltec E-Flow 16s and the Abyss A200s. In the future, we're going to experiment further using Abyss A400s on a closed loop, which is absolutely insane considering that we're using that pump currently to feed six aquariums in a 2500 gallon system. As a bonus, Many of these pumps are also controllable, and in the case of the Abyss, it has a wave function to ramp up and down continuously to provide a variable flow. I think the Ecotechs have something similar as well. Let's get into the cons, the downsides. Unfortunately, no system is perfect, and there are some drawbacks to consider before installing closed loops. The first downside is that you will likely have to drill your tank to install bulkheads. This is much easier in acrylic tanks, but not impossible on glass tanks. There are tutorials online on how to do that. I personally have never done it. I left that to the tank manufacturers. There is an inherent risk in drilling a tank, and there are structural integrity concerns when you decide to go crazy with the number of input and output holes. You don't really want to Swiss cheese your tank. Second downside is that bulkheads and plumbing can and do leak. I personally think that this is an overblown risk, but it is a mental hurdle that absolutely stops a lot of hobbyists in their tracks when considering a closed loop implementation. If you have a bulkhead on the bottom of your tank, it could leak and in theory empty the entire volume of the tank because it is sitting right there at the bottom. In practice though, a small leak is more likely to just dry up and the deposits will effectively reseal the tank. For a tank to fully drain because of a small pinhole leak through a bulkhead, it's basically never gonna happen. The tank will evaporate all of its water faster than it's going to drip out. Still, we routinely go around and inspect all of the bulkheads on our tanks because over time they can get a little bit looser. I will add this one thing to this discussion though. A lot of what causes these leaks is screwing and unscrewing stuff from the bulkheads because most bulkheads unfortunately are not reverse threaded. When we go to unscrew a piece of plumbing, it simultaneously loosens the bulkhead a little. Not a lot, but that little bit of loosening pressure over time can cause a leak that we have to tighten up. We've used both the cheap Schedule 80 bulkheads from China as well as nice Schedule 80s from Spears and I believe those spears are made in America, and both, unfortunately, are still leak risks. My favorite bulkheads now are from Hayward, primarily because they are reverse threaded. When we unscrew output attachments from them, they tighten down rather than loosen. Third downside. Closed loop systems involve a lot more plumbing. Compared to just sticking a powerhead into your tank, a closed loop requires bulkheads, valves, all sort of plumbing connections, and these things can get very complicated depending on how creative you want to get. Plumbing is also one of those expenses that can sneak up on you, especially if you go with larger diameter pipes or the Schedule 80 gray stuff. People often get sticker shock at how much we spend on things like abyss pumps, but truth be known, the bill for plumbing is a lot more. Fourth downside. Remember when I mentioned external pumps are cooler than submersible pumps? And what I mean there is that there's less heat transferred to the water. And that's supposed to be a positive thing, right? There is a flip side to that. Pumps really appreciate offloading their heat into your water. Water conducts heat away from the pump much better than air. And it's possible that pumps can overheat in these closed loop systems, especially if they are malfunctioning for some reason and they build up more heat than usual. Fifth downside, you have to choose your pumps carefully. A lot of pumps say that they can be mounted externally like this. Some pumps do not like head pressure and their performance will drop off substantially when you start sending the output flow to multiple flow assemblies. You might end up with just a trickle coming out. 
Sixth downside, we're already up to number six. You have to protect the intake with a strainer of some sort for both the sake of the pump and the sake of the animals in your tank. As we've mentioned before, it's possible to put monster-sized pumps onto a closed-loop configuration, and the intake of that pump, plumbed directly to your display, can easily kill something by sucking it in, so you want to protect your fish and inverts, and honestly you want to protect hard shells from getting sucked in and damaging the pump. Seventh, and final downside, you know that protective screen that we just talked about? Pumps often do not like intake restrictions. Again, some pumps handle this better than others, but you want to find screens that do the job protection-wise with the least amount of restriction of flow. We've used a number of different types of strainers, but we haven't exactly settled on a best solution just yet. Maybe in the future something can be 3D printed and we would just buy it. Just saying for all you 3D printer guys out there, we're still looking for the best thing. What we're trying to achieve in the perfect strainer, quote unquote, is one that A, is fine enough to keep fish and inverts safe. We've used strainers that have holes too large and stuff can just get through. It's not a pretty sight. B, we want those holes open enough that it doesn't overly restrict the pump's intake. Your mileage may vary depending on which pumps you have, but generally speaking, pumps do not like restricted intakes. It's just not a good thing. And C, we want one that's low profile so that it's less obtrusive and it's easier to service given that there's going to be rock work in the tank. A giant basket is great for providing this diffused suction, but it is no fun to get in and out of a tank. A lower profile strainer is easier to maintain, but too low profile. And again, it becomes a risk for your critters because the suction force of that pump becomes more and more and more risky the lower and lower and lower profile you have. It's basically like the event horizon of a black hole. Practical tips. Now that we've gone over the pros and cons, I want to give you guys some tips, assuming that closed loops still sound like a good idea to you. First up, while we're on the topic of strainer maintenance, if you find something that works really well for you, you might want to go ahead and buy a few backups and rotate them in and out. Sometimes these things need a good long soak in acid, and it's nice to be able to quickly swap in a fresh one while the dirty one gets clean. Next up, here's a plumbing tip. Unions are your friend. The clear benefit is being able to shut off the flow like a true union ball valve, and you remove the pumps for cleaning. A lesser known benefit is to be able to spin the pipe a little bit if a leak occurs. So sometimes when people are plumbing, external plumbing in general, they never consider that once bulkheads start to get loose and things, just to have that little ability to rotate a pipe is really important. Having a lot of these union connections gives you exactly that kind of flexibility. Let's go ahead and assume that you've implemented those unions correctly. It's time to service that pump. You close off the true union ball valves and then you unscrew the pump. Guess what? A lot of water. A lot of water still in that pump. A lot of water is still in those plumbing lines. A drainage pan is a lifesaver in this case. It allows you to collect all of that water in a nice safe spot and you can just shop back it out and wipe it all down when you're done. Easy peasy. So guys, get drip trays. Last tip that I'll leave you with, cable management. I love me some cable management, but it's certainly possible to overdo it and making servicing the pump more difficult by trying to tuck everything away and out of sight. My tip is, if you want to do that still, use zip ties for the things like power supplies that don't necessarily need to move that much and use Velcro for pump lines so you can remove that pump and take it to the sink. All right, after I've gone through all of that, in my opinion, personal verdict, I love them. Is it the perfect thing for all situations? Certainly not. It can be total overkill in smaller aquariums, but they start to pay dividends once you start to have larger and larger aquariums where you don't want to have obtrusive pumps stuck to your glass, like in a peninsula style tank, for example. So I hope this video gave you guys another tool to think about with regard to flow in your aquariums. Flow is becoming better understood in recent years, and some consider it the most important factor to success in a reef tank. More important than lighting, more important than filtration. Yeah, flow. All right, guys, that's it from here. Happy reefing.